Welcome to another poem present uh, reading. Michael Fried is a professor of humanities at Johns Hopkins. He's a famous art critic and art historian, as you all know. But he's here today as a poet, and that, I take it, is different. The writing of poems is not primarily a historical discipline, not when it goes well. Aristotle said that the poet is instead concerned with universals. I think that this might be a way of saying that poems more directly express values than historical writing does, and that the values of poets are not meant to be contingent upon temporal and geographical circumstances. It's very hard to define, let alone to celebrate, values directly. Most intellectual writing is ironic. Most of the poems of our time are ironic. And that's a problem, as Stanley Cavell has argued. Michael's poems are about living with value, known and respected, not displaced and mysterious value. What follows, what follows from a recognition of value, the poems seem to ask? Well, fear that the valuable will be lost. In fact, loss of valuables does follow from the recognition of value. Reconstruction and reduction after loss. The poems chart all these consequences. But one thing in particular is very clear, and it sets Michael at odds with the temper of his time and with his academic audience. Social progress does not come from the recognition of value. In these poems, all that is valuable is set in adversity by its political context. The political is no region of hope for this poet. I can speak so abstractly of Michael's poems because they're very direct. He has some of the interests of his poetic contemporaries, as in the prose poem or in poems about (coughs) paintings. But he's honest and bold about the sources of his writing in thought, in reading, and in experience more than in language experimentation. I take this as a great artistic benefit of maturity though in a sense he is a young poet still with more books to write, I'm sure. Please join me in welcoming the author of the new book, The Next Bend in the Road, published, I'm proud to say, by the University of Chicago Press, Michael Freed. Thank you, Bob. Um, I really appreciate those words. So, um, I'm going to read to you uh, from three books, um, two of which exist and one is uh, in the making. Uh, The first is a book called uh, To the Center of the Earth, which appeared in 1994 and contains work written over a long period of time, uh, going back to the 1960s. Um, One of the things that led me uh, to decide to do that today Um, was the fact that I knew that Stanley Cavell would be in this audience. Uh, And there are poems in this book of which Stanley was one of the first two readers, um, two or three readers, along with uh, our wonderful composer friend, John Harbison. But I wanted to give you just a little bit of a sense of uh, of a trajectory. Um, I've always written poetry. I started writing poetry uh, my freshman year um, at Princeton, I had the great good fortune of working with R.P. Blackmer as an undergraduate. And another, um, I would say, factor, especially in the poems in the first book, was my deep involvement with abstract art, um, which meant, among other things, that I operated on the assumption that a relatively small number of elements could yield a completely autonomous and satisfying uh, work, as in the sculpture of Anthony Caro or the paintings of Kenneth Noland. So many of the poems in that first book are short, um, and in everything I've done, uh, there is no pursuit more important, I'll just simply say this as a framing statement, um, than intensity. These are lyric poems. I'm going to read a few from this first book. Heart. I'm also going to describe the poems so you can picture them a little bit. This is a poem with just four lines. Heart. 
Your body seen from the feet sleeping. White with rose blemishes sweet to the tongue. Wakes and turning over takes me blind to its heart. Numbers of these poems go back um, to the 1960s, the second half of the 1960s, uh, which was, of course, the time of uh, Vietnam in this country and the struggle over civil rights and other things. Um, There are aspects of the present moment that are not completely without affinity to that earlier moment. This is a poem called Depths of Four Lines, and it really comes out of uh, the experience of 1968 in particular, and this uncanny feeling that one had in America at that time that you had only to look at someone to know everything about them. Four lines again. Suddenly there is nothing that is not revealed by faces alone. America, like a hounded shark, not knowing where to turn, makes for the depths, taking us down. A three-line poem called Powers. Our bodies are the closed eyes of a single animal. Our states of mind so extreme they are the same. Like the art we lend each other new powers. From the height, six lines. I wish there was something, some further thing that I could do or thanks that I could give or words that came to mind that I could speak, hopefully, from the heights of my misanthropy, outlasting the effects of your sleeping pill towards destinations that are in flames. Memories, three lines and two lines. I knew casually two or three of them whom even then I hated. Hated because they were worthless and because they had had you and I hadn't. If their memories are anything like mine, They have you at their beck and call forever. A poem about my parents called The Dance, about a dozen lines. My father has been dead just over six months, but last night my mother dreamed that they were dancing. Ben was never actually a very good dancer, she says, astonished by her romantic unconscious. Yet in my dream, he was indescribably graceful, and we glided across the floor in picture-perfect synchrony. And I, who wouldn't have known where to look had I been there, have no difficulty visualizing a handsome Jewish couple in their late twenties, younger by an age than we are now, captivating an entire ballroom as the band plays on. I am the outcome of that dance. Japan. Five four-line stances. I know where the beginning comes from. Um, uh, For many, many years, I was absolutely haunted for decades by Delmore Schwartz's beautiful poem, beginning, uh, Tired and Unhappy You Think of Houses. Japan. Tired and empty, I occupy a winterized log cabin in a clearing in a snowy wood in a country that might be Japan. Each morning I catechize myself in the hope that there has been a change either from or into the new man it appears I've partly become. Lunch arrives in a wicker basket that later will be taken away 
but when I rush to the window, the encircling snow lies undefiled. Towards midnight, I shall step outside and expose my face to the stars and weep, not merely from the cold. May their beauty appease me. My best moments are those when, in default of inspiration, my hand rests lightly on the wrist of the one who writes. Well, when this book was um, in press, uh, the manuscript was off, it had been copy edited and so on, um, one last poem came, and it's the last poem in the book. Um, and at the time, it was very mysterious to me, uh, also thrilling, um, because as has happened to me just a few times in my life, um, the first lines came in a dream, just like that. I woke up, and I had the first two lines. And I had, I had a piece of the third line, and the rest, it's only four lines, I had to do myself. Um, and it ends the book. It's called A Block of Ice. I stamp my foot and a black wave races across the field. I close my eyes and white stones spring up that I must avoid. My hand in the freezing water gropes for but fails to find a block of ice on which to sign my name and the date and hour of my death. So I didn't know what to make of that poem um, for a long time. Uh, I was grateful for it, but I didn't know exactly what it was about. Then I came to realize, in a way, what it was about, and that is that at the time I wrote it, um, which would have been, I don't know, 92, 93, I had written a whole series of books that I'd set out to write a long time before, and although I hadn't finished uh, a book on Manet, that would, in a way, complete the cycle of those books. Um, it was well advanced, and I could see that I would complete it. I was near completing it. So there was a sense in which I had, uh, was on the verge of completing um, a very ambitious project that I'd set out to do a long time before, and also that these poems were going to come out in a book, um, which I had more or less despaired of. So the question that the poem asks, or the po question in a way that the poem answers is, um, is there anything more? And the poem is saying, yeah, there might be something more. Um, the book came out in 94, and then in the spring of um, 1995, uh, my wife and I uh, flew to China and went to Wuhan, China, We'd been married for a very long time without children, and we adopted um, a little girl at that, that moment, not quite 11 months. So, yeah, there was a lot more to come that I couldn't possibly have imagined when I wrote that poem. And um, a number of the poems in the book that Bob mentioned, The Next Bend in the Road, um, refer directly uh, to that experience, that change of life. But I think the book as a whole um, reflects um, the, uh, the breaking open of my life and indeed my wife's life by this um, spectacular event. The first poem in The Next Bend in the Road is called The Send-Off, and I'm going to read a series of poems really about my daughter. The send off. This is three stanzas, irregular stanzas. The hummingbird looks up from his flower punch bowl with an expression of pure dazzlement. The May morning is that perfect. Our 11 month old daughter in her grandma's gift raspberry sundress is that astonishing. She came here in stages from Wuhan, China, where we adopted her in the eye of a cyclone. En route from the orphanage, all the while Anna slept in your arms. Her birth mother's tears rose wave-like from the dusty earth to speed us on our way.
four stanzas of two lines. The way it works, uh, almost always now, if you're adopting a baby in China, is you go as part of a group to the city where you're actually going to receive the child in the orphanage. Um, And then, after that, you go and you spend several days in a very fancy hotel called the White Swan Hotel in Guangzhou, the former Canton. And you kind of just get to know the child there, and you do various things having to do with uh, emigration and so on. So this poem is called In the White Swan Hotel, Guangzhou. Four stanzas, two lines each. A man who thinks he is my father gazes at the traffic on the Pearl River. A woman who first took me in her arms yesterday looks down at me and cries with joy. I don't know what choices I have other than to bestow or withhold my love. I'll wait until I can understand their foreign, passionate speech, and then we'll see. A short prose poem, and about a third of the poems in this new book are prose poems. For most of my life, I didn't understand prose poems. I had no sympathy for prose poems. Um, I couldn't grasp what they were about, and then I started to write them. The Kite. Just a few, just a short poem. The Kite. Our first walk with Anna in the park in Wuhan. Old men with tiny fishing rods fly exquisite bird-shaped kites, but there are no birds in the dazzling void. They smile when they see us. We approach them. By a heroic feat of mutual comprehension, it becomes clear that they approve of what, they are there for, of what we are there for once they are assured she is not a boy. The Meadow. Four line stanzas. Our joy is so great, it casts a shadow across all the future we dare to imagine. Nevertheless, we cheer Anna on as she toddles on sturdy legs toward a sunlit meadow in which we are not. Above the pines, a red hawk tracks her on a whim. I want to warn her to call out, but my voice is frozen. Carefree and high-stepping, Anna plunges ahead. Her mother, too, sees the hawk. Her tears flow in profusion. Our daughter hears them fall. Laughing, she turns and waves. Hell raging in his heart, the red hawk sails out of sight. And now, peaceful night shakes out its many worlds. The meadow, the sunlit meadow, will be back tomorrow. A three-line poem called The Flower. One short flight below, I hear you and our daughter passionately pouring yourselves into each other like two oceans collaborating on a flower. A poem in two line stanzas called The Tunnel. To be nothing but fire, not even the fuel that feeds it, wasn't my father's style. When the time came for him to die of a cirrhotic liver caused by poisoned blood, flushed through him one winter dawn to fight a bleeding ulcer, he found a stone wall with, at its base, a tunnel just too narrow to admit a man. Undaunted, he crawled through, hand over hand, to the other side. And now a poem called Care, which is dedicated to Alan Grossman, 
I know that Alan recently visited here and read his poems and spoke about poetry. So those of you who heard him will have some sense of the imagined stakes of this poem. It's in three parts. Care. The badger knows several great artists intimately. This is said without irony. He thinks of them as great because they have made numinous paintings and sculptures that will last thousands of years if care is taken of them. But will care be taken of them? The badger is worried. Two. He has an older friend who collects ancient pots. The friend is a poet of a breed altogether beyond the badger's comprehension, who spends hours looking at the pots, admiring their form and markings, and imagining how they were once used. In the dimness of pre-dawn, the poet's apartment is like a cave in Neolithic China, minus the harsh, rich smell of burning dung. Three. Recently, the poet acquired another pot, minuscule, exquisite, of hard gray stone worked to absolute smoothness. Egyptian. He is convinced it was a scribe's inkwell. When the time comes, he will dip his pen in it to write his gravest songs. Then a poem in three line stanzas called The End of History. And it is the case um, that the poems in this book, as opposed to the poems in the previous book, um, it may already be clear, open up uh, to the outside world, say more explicitly than anything I had written before. And this is one of the poems where that begins to happen. Three line stanzas, five of them, the end of history. The first line is in italics as a kind of quotation. The moments denting inward like a can, the poet wrote in a fever of expectancy. But the line went nowhere. It had nowhere to go. All around her bullets did their bloody work. Paving stones were heaped up to make barricades, but the insurrection went nowhere. It had nowhere to go. She felt she could almost grasp the dialectic with her naked feet as it rushed foaming toward annihilation. But the antithesis went nowhere. It had nowhere to go. Her lover rose and lit a cigarette. Not long afterward, he would die, and she would have no choice but to sell their apartment. Her passion turned inward, having nowhere else to go. As for the dent and the can, they alone are victorious. Neither the insurrection nor the dialectic meant the least thing to them at any time, nor the poet and her lover, nor the flower-filled apartment. I take that to be a poem about the deep indifference of poetry itself to its instruments. Then the poem that gives the title to the volume, um, it's the first of a trilogy in the book, but I'm just going to, or a triptych, I'm just going to read this first poem. It's called The Next Bend in the Road. Um, it carries an epigraph from uh, Osip Mandelstam's widow, the remarkable Najda Mandelstam. And the epigraph says, if there's a mention of eyelashes, then it's about Osip. And that's a reference to the poems of uh, Marina Tsvetaeva. With, and Mandelstam and Tsvetaeva had a brief affair years before. Mandelstam, as a young man, as a young poet, had famously long and thick eyelashes. And what Najda, what Mandelstam is saying is in, in Tsvetaeva's poems, any time you have something about eyelashes, it's awesome. It's about 15, 16 lines. 
The young man with long, thick eyelashes is unapologetically drunk with the world's beauty, despite or possibly because of the hollowness at its core, which he confirms in the slightly dead timbre of the distant church bells sounding the hour. Meanwhile, the little horses jog onward without the least appearance of strain, their breath issuing visibly in twin dissolving plumes of cloud. And the extraordinarily pretty woman, scarcely more than a girl, whose head rests on the young man's shoulder, although she has a husband to whom she will return, is for the moment all his, just beyond the next bend in the road, or if not the next, the bend after that, still hidden by the towering fir trees, their dark, drooping, vigorous branches loaded with snow. I forgot to say that this is a winter scene, that the youthful lovers are in a sleigh, that they are both poets, that they will come to similar ends. The revolution waits. The Drowned and the Saved, um, three four-line stanzas, and as you know, that's the title of Primo Levi's um, last and grimmest um, memoir of his time in Auschwitz and his reflections on that experience. The Drowned and the Saved. As we read, Primo Levi is falling. He doesn't cry out or wave his arms. On the grass outside the barn, it's dark, but also light. A full moon floats on a sea of cottony clouds, and Primo Levi is falling from the third floor to the ground floor inexplicably, and the moon is shrouded in clouds that now seem like an army of sheep advancing like a plague, and Primo Levi is falling. His eyes are wide open. Now he is passing the second floor, and the moon is being carried away by the sheep who will eat it in silence. Now a a number of prose poems. Various themes. First is called Kafka's Drawings. I mean, those of you who have spent any time with Kafka know that uh, he produced marvelous, strange little drawings. Kafka's Drawings. It turns out that Kafka always wanted to draw to hold fast to what was seen, as he put it. He also said of the little cartoon-like men in his drawings, they come out of the dark to vanish into the dark, and my drawing is a perpetually renewed and unsuccessful attempt at primitive magic. Was he dismayed by that unsuccess? It seems not. He accepted without complaint that his drawing's magic was imperfect, that between the pencil in his hand and the sheet of paper on his desk, something intervened to derail his best efforts to capture the shapes of life in their endlessly seductive but also undeniably comic, therefore inexplicably, inescapably tragic vitality. The surviving drawings suggest, against all likelihood, that it was precisely the dimension, the perspective of the tragic that eluded him. The Essence of Poetry. It's another prose poem. And it comes from, it's based on uh, material in Jakobsen's uh, memoirs of his futurist years. It begins with a, something that is said to Jakobsen, the essence of poetry. I have to say that in this exchange... Um, I'm entirely on the part of the initial um, quotation, what is said to Jakobsen. So, understand, the essence of poetry is not in rhymes nor in the verse. It is there so that the eyes can be seen and so that something can be seen in the eyes. Sergei Asenin said this to Roman Jakobsen in the Café Pittoresque in Moscow around 1918. 
The fiery arch formalist remembered it all his life, despite his evident bafflement. What did Senin mean? For Jakobsen, champion of Klebnikov and Mayakovsky, the essence of poetry consisted in an armory of verbal, verbal devices that by deliberately impeding the poetic, conjured it into being. And yet in his monograph on Klebnikov, he would soon write, form exists for us only so long as it is difficult to perceive, so long as we sense the resistance of the material, so long as we waver as to whether what we read is prose or poetry, so long as our cheekbones ache, as General Ermolov's cheekbones ached, according to Pushkin's report during the reading of Gribodov's verse. From the cheekbones to the eyes is no impassable distance. Giselle Lestrange. For several years before she died, we occasionally spent an evening in the company of Paul Ceylon's widow, the etcher Giselle Lestrange. We met her first at a party thrown by Parisian friends to celebrate their engagement. She was charming, with the indefinable magnetism certain older, cultivated European women possess, whether or not they were beauties in their youth, and a great directness, which led her once when driving across the Seine in the company of an American translator to observe in an ordinary tone of voice that just below was where Ceylon had drowned himself. Her words took my breath away, the translator recalls. Until that night, I had never seen her etchings. Our friends owned three or four, and what surprised me was their restraint, as if the artist had been too familiar with the demands of art to wish to satisfy them completely. On closer view, the bite of the acid was everywhere deliberately reined in, not from excessive finesse, but from an unwillingness to mark deeply. I thought, she has experienced illuminations she has no desire to impart other than by the faintest shiver of contrast. Months later, after a chance meeting at a concert, Giselle Lestrange came back to our recently acquired pied a terre and sat and talked for an hour over a glass of wine. <coughs> then I went down with her into Rue Lafayette to help hail a taxi. Rain was falling, and it took a few minutes before I captured one and held the door open as she got in. That was the nearest I have come to touching poetry's hem. The Earthquake in Chile, which, as you know, is the title of a story by the great Kleist. Nothing is more remarkable in Kleist than his fierce aversion to the ordinary course of events by which the human race propagates itself. And yet he is unable to imagine simply doing away with biological reproduction. The conflict that result lies at the heart of several of his most powerful stories. In the last page or so of the earthquake in Chile, for example, the humane and courageous Don Fernando struggles heroically to defend two unmarried lovers and their small son, Felipe, against a murderous mob intent on killing all three. But the melee has a tragic end. Both lovers are felled by colossal blows, and Don Fernando's own young son, Juan, has his brains dashed out as well. Afterward, Don Fernando keeps the truth from his wife out of fear that it would kill her too, but she learns it nonetheless and grieves deeply until one morning, with the trace of a tear glistening in her eye, she threw her arms around her husband's neck and kissed him. The story closes with one of the most shocking sentences in all literature. Don Fernando and Doña Elvira then adopted the little stranger as their own son. And when Don Fernando compared Felipe with Juan and the ways in which he had acquired the two of them, it almost seemed to him that he had reason to be glad. I don't know what I would have made of this before adopting my treasure of a daughter. Now I read it as acknowledging the violence and tragedy that are the inevitable prologue to any adoption and as offering the hope that notwithstanding that history, everything may yet turn out, if not for the absolute best, the word almost in the final clause is written in blood. At any rate, well enough for ordinary happiness. A Night at the Opera. 
And this carries the dedication for John Harbison, the composer I mentioned earlier. Young women in kerchiefs, terrified they will not be believed, swear they have not been raped. The setting is abstract, a bare, dark, floodlit stage before the curtain. First one woman sings, then another, then the third, finally all three together. For a time, the husbands are taciturn and withdrawn, but as the women's unexpectedly vigorous sopranos, urged on by the orchestra, leap up toward the night sky, they break out angrily in clashing discords. The libretto, too, is minimal. A dozen phrases repeated over and over on the part of the women passionate insistence that although they were interned and beaten, they were not violated. On the part of the husband's unquenchable suspicion, misery, rage. Toward morning, the music relaxes and subsides. One by one, the young women fall silent. Behind the curtain, we can just catch fragments of conversation, of laughter, their former captors return to their own villages and disappear back into mankind. A very short, in effect, a prose poem, which amounts to a variation on one of the great short lyric poems of the 20th century, um, Giuseppe Ungaretti's poem written in the trenches in First World War, First World War the poem called Veglia. Um, some of you will know it. It's a poem of the highest crystalline perfection and absolute intensity. Um, you can translate it easily into English, but it has no intensity in English if you do that. I read it for the first time when I was um, 21 years old and in Rome and became absolutely haunted by it and carried it with me for 30 years more. Um, until one day, actually walking around Berlin, um, this poem, this variation on it, uh, started to come. The title here is Full Moonlight. Full moonlight beaming down into their putrid shell hole, into Giuseppe Ungaretti's disemboweled companion's gaping mouth. The poet, normally abstemious with words, writes letter after letter overflowing with love. I have never been so attached to life, he tells no one in particular, between sobs. Two more prose poems. One of them is my daughter's favorite among all these poems. I needn't tell you that when you're a parent of a young child, you read a lot of stories um, featuring animals. And in various, there, in, well, you, heard, you saw the badger in the earlier poem. There are other poems where animals um, play a role. And this is called The Hilltop. On a high hilltop one autumn afternoon, three recent arrivals, a fox, an eagle, a rabbit. The fox speaks. I made my way here by devious paths, traveling mainly at night. I killed only when I had to, but when there was no choice, I didn't flinch. The journey took years. I was little more than a pup when I set out, and now, well, let's just say I'm middle-aged for a fox. It had better have been worth it than the eagle. I came without forethought. I was flying from the northern glacier to the southern ocean when I suddenly noticed this mound of intense color hundreds of feet below. It looked welcoming. I don't know how else to put it. So I descended. If yet again life disappoints me, I'm gone. Finally, the rabbit. All my life I've been afraid and run from trouble as fast as I can. And of course, when I'm running like that, my mind is a complete blank. I've no idea where I am or where I'm going. My lungs feel like they're about to explode into bloody shreds. Sometimes I defecate in mid-hop from sheer terror. I ran and ran, and here I am. And finally, a short prose poem called Due North. Oriented to the stars, the poet marches briskly due north on a windy night in his 58th year. <laughs> 
The sensory deprivation of Iowa City, in the words of his host, surrounds him on four sides. But who cares? It's pitch black and the wind is trampling on his face with such unbridled elan that he laughs out loud. A new, more refined intuition of mortality enters his heart like the blade of a spear on which has been engraved the figure of a heart. In my own generation, the poet, um, I, I, it's hard for me to stop using the present tense, but let me say that I was closest to for most of my poetic writing life, was an English contemporary I met in my early 20s at Oxford, a wonderful poet named Ian Hamilton, who died, um, who smoked 200 cigarettes a day or whatever, and uh, died several years ago of cancer. Um, This is a one-line poem called Last Visit from Ian Hamilton. Without empathy, the camera briefly looked the dying poet in the eye and saw everything. And then another poem, maybe a dozen lines. I can tell you it's also Ian, um, called The Dream. He came to me and said, I want you to take her. How can I, I said. You know I'm not free. And even if I were, doesn't the lady have a vote? He shook his great head. She will do what I say. When I was alive, she never refused me. How much less will she now when I am no more? when my only covering is the tatters of your dream. And then a poem in couplets called The Realm of Spirit. Um, This is my confessional poem. Every word in this is true. When I wrote my poems and kept them in a drawer, I believed I was William Blake in a closet. The pathos of my unappreciated genius bowed my shoulders but put spring in my step. In that divided mood, each line I composed seemed to me a triumph against prodigious odds. I communicated this sense of struggle to my friends who treated me with the respect due a warrior. And I exhaled contempt for the famous names whose anodyne verses collected yearly prizes. I lived like that for decades, impregnable in the knowledge that my castle had no drawbridge. Then one day, in a trance of inadvertence, I sent my poems to an editor who published them. Now the drawer is empty and the closet is sealed, and I know that in the realm of spirit I am nothing. is a poem about a painting, Manet's Déjeuner Célèbre. It's called Le Déjeuner Célèbre. It's dedicated um, to my friend and another passionate admirer of that painting, T.J. Clark. Um, for me, the entire history of art is before the Déjeuner Célèbre and after the Déjeuner Célèbre. Um, I think I became an art historian in order to come to grips with the Déjeuner Célèbre. It's a poem in couplets. A bullfinch poses in mid-flight like the Holy Ghost above the picnickers. In a pond in the middle distance, a woman wearing a shift seems, I repeat, seems to be douching herself. The other woman, naked, seated on the grass and twisting her rubbery neck to look at us is no beauty, but try to ignore her. In contrast, the men are expendable. There is nothing going on in their heads. Their gestures are vacuous. Their wide open eyes gleam meaninglessly. Only their brilliant accoutrements reward our attention, especially the clay gray trousers, miniature cane, rose cravat, and black pillbox cap of the type on the right. In the lower left corner, an angry calligraphic frog wonders why these stilted Parisian nobodies have invaded his bright green 
woodland world. It was a moment in the history of the art of painting when the weight of the broken water rushing out to sea exactly counterbalanced the force of the waves rushing in. No matter how hard we try, we cannot imagine actually entering that space, partaking of that food, breathing that non-existent air. When, at the age of 18, I first stood staring and breathless in the Jeux de Pomme, what most astounded me was that the paint appeared still wet. A poem in three line stanzas. There are about a half dozen more poems. But this is still from the book. Called A Summer Night. Alone, confused, dyslexic. I sit down where I find myself in the middle of a field. Around me, the night expands in concentric circles, each a different color, green, red, purple. In a nearby ditch, frogs chant their sacred literature at the bottoms of their voices. I look up, but the stars are nowhere to be seen. Clouds churn from skyline to skyline. It takes a while, but my breathing returns to normal. The colors contract to a single stone. As I re-enter the barn, my daughter, standing at her easel, completes the letter A triumphantly. The conclusive brushstroke plows from left to right with the force of the sun. Then I'm going to read you just... Four poems from a new manuscript. I mean, the manuscript is not finished by any means. But I've chosen two poems about painting, in a way, about abstract painting, and two poems written on the death of Jacques Derrida. Um, But one of the things that I've discovered is coming to the fore in this book is, I mean, autobiography would be the wrong way to put it, But uh, going back to particular moments um, in my life uh, and in relation to art, in relation to various friends. This is called 1959. 1959 is the year I graduated from college. By then I was already writing art criticism. Um, Someone named Frank appears in this poem. That's the painter Frank Stella who was a close friend of mine from my freshman year, his sophomore year. 1959. Michael, you've gone from boy strength to man strength, Frank said to me approvingly. But he was wrong. When we wrestled, it took less than half a minute before he was sitting on my chest. He rose disappointed. He preferred a challenge. One sweltering late afternoon in New York, Darby obliged him. Still close friends, they went at each other like mortal enemies for a solid hour as I stood and watched, appalled. Earlier that day, we had driven to beneath the Brooklyn Bridge and walked around and smoked cigars and felt shiningly alive. The 60s hadn't yet begun, but we knew with utmost certainty that whatever was coming to pass until then without us, we three would have a hand in it. Frank, first of all. These paths lead only into painting, Carl Andre wrote about his stripes later that year. And they did. They did, as far as they went. And then, a few years later, in 1962, um, I became fully aware of the work of a painter who had just died named Morris Lewis. I subsequently organized the retrospective exhibition of, wrote a book about, and so on. And particular, among his paintings, there's a type of painting called The Unfurled, um, which I continue to regard as one of the absolute pictorial inventions of genius of the 20th century. Um, there are probably about 70 of them. So this is a poem in couplets called Unfurled. 
At the Guggenheim Museum in November 1962, I visited a memorial exhibition of 17 stained paintings by the late Morris Lewis, including my first unfurled. I walked into the high gallery, Wright's Holy of Holies, and there it hung, 14 feet across, mostly untouched cotton duck, evenly spaced, taut, billowing rivulets of unmixed acrylic colors running at a downward, inward angle from both sides of an, to me, then, unthinkable expanse of sheer Mallarmean blankness. It was, I told friends later that same day, exactly like being punched very hard in the solar plexus by a total stranger who means no harm, who means only beauty. And then two poems occasioned um, by the death of Jacques Derrida earlier this year. Um, The first is a prose poem And it alludes to um, Derrida's repeated impulse to speak of the marks made by animals um, as a form of language. I think Bob is absolutely right to say that my poetry is essentially devoid of irony. Here, I would admit to a certain amount of absolute affectionate irony. The death of Jacques Derrida. Somewhere in the north, a vast lake, partly frozen. Snow covering the ground on the fir trees in the distant hills. The sky, a deep, radiant, metaphysical blue. Cold wind blowing in gusts. A magnificent day. No humans in view, that's the important thing. But from the dark recesses of the forest, there one by one or in small squads comes forth an ordinarily mutually shunning population of foxes, wolves, bear, elk, deer, beaver, otters, raccoons, porcupines, hares, moles wincing at the light, skunks, squirrels, field mice, no doubt other lesser creatures as well, all seemingly pacific, self-contained, one might say preoccupied. And for perhaps an hour, they mill or skitter or in a few cases leap about to no apparent purpose, the stronger taking care not to step accidentally upon the weaker. After which, they return to the forest, silently for the most part. On the snow, tens of thousands of hoof and paw prints, involuntary brushings of tails, urine traces, steaming turds, even a few crimson specks of blood. A message of farewell to one who held them in his thought. And then a poem, second poem on Derrida's death. Uh, three stanzas, four lines, three lines, four lines, called The Message. According to the theory of deconstruction, The sender of a message is absent in principle, even when she sits touching the excited receiver with her knee. So as Jacques Derrida drafted a few sentences to be read aloud at the memorial service that was held the week after he disappeared, he smiled, despite not feeling great, to think how moved that solemn gathering would be by words that did nothing more than allegorize the condition of all speech. And finally, a poem in eight lines, four couplets. It's actually the poem that brings the next bend in the road to an end. And the spacing on the page is sort of double. There's extra space between the lines and extra space between the stanzas. And it's called simply Song. It's a poem that came out of, uh, again, literally decades of wrestling with a kind of obsessive image um, of a great fish at the end of a line, and it kept trying to find a way to get into my poetry. Um, 
and it did and it didn't work and then eventually this happened. And for me this is a poem, well it brings the book to an end. It's also one of those poems that I put it in my mind. There are certain poems I think of as nodal. I mean they seem to exist at places where many different realms of meaning cross. Song. The hook twists against the leaper's strength. Against his flight and fall back into a rising wall of spray. Against you. Against me. Against the very thought of swimming free. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about um, the poem that you said uh, was truly confessional. Um, I was struck by the juxtaposition between the sense of spiritual strength that came with having this uh, private intellectual project and what you suggested was a sense of um, annihilation that came with the uh, dissemination of that project. I may have literalized it for the poem, but you, you invited its literalization. Yeah, sure. Thing. Well, I think what it... Could you talk about that? Again? Sure, sure. I think what, I, what really the poem is trying to say is that as long as... <clears throat> there was just a long period of time during which, for whatever reason, I, would be, I was writing these poems and, and not trying to publish them, not sending them out. Um, and it was, apart from anything else, it was sort of like massively neurotic. It also came from a certain kind of, I think, of, of, on the one hand, it's impossible to overvalue poetry. On the other hand, it's, it, it is absolutely possible, it's very tempting to overvalue something about it or about one's own relation to it. So I was writing the poems, I was putting them in a drawer. I was then resenting the hell out of every other poet on earth except Alan Grossman and Ian Hamilton. Um, I, I mean, it was just, it was just immensely screwed up as a way of proceeding. And what sort of broke me out of it were two, I mean, just to answer frankly, were sort of two events. Um, one, a point where uh, my wife said to me that she thought psychotherapy might be helpful to me, and I said something like, what do you mean it might be helpful to me? <laughs> um, what, I mean, why, why would it be helpful to me? And she said, well, you know, I said, what would I talk to her? To, 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 to a therapist, to an analyst about it. What would I talk to him about? And she said, well, you could talk to him. I mean, something you could talk about is why you write these poems and put them in a drawer. I thought, yeah, I really could talk about that. <laughs> um, that was strange behavior. The other, the other factor that led to my breaking out of, uh, out of that uh, form of nuttiness was, uh, was Alan Grossman. <clears throat> I mean, Grossman came to Hopkins, and Grossman was very encouraging to me about my poems. But he found it completely uninteresting that I was putting it to drum. There was just no element of pathos and drama in this for him. It was simply the behavior of a moron. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, since I had a tremendous desire to have Alan regard me as something more interesting than a moron, um, all of that you know, got me, I started sending poems out. Now, but what goes with that, of course, is, is the break, you, break the, you break the sealedness of your fantasy. I mean, there's a sort of tragic fantasy of the melodrama in the sense that you're so on it. Suddenly you're publishing the poems, the poems appear, the world doesn't immediately change. I mean, not the, not, the, only, the only thing that changes in your life is that you're publishing these poems. Um, and the, uh, if they're, I mean, I, you know, I say in the realm of spirit, I am nothing. I mean, in the realm of spirit, one will, you, one will never know what one is. Um, but the fantasy beforehand was, it went with the sense of tragic isolation, you can imagine. So that's the force of it that suddenly you're living, you've, 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 in a certain sense, you've normalized the activity. Um, and it's much better that way. And there are now the satisfactions of practicing, of actually publishing, but the satisfactions are now just real satisfactions. You know, they're not, they're out of that 
realm of the seal book. But this whole account naturalizes the business of publishing poems, which is not at all a natural process. I mean, except if you accept it as natural. That is, what makes um, that be so self-evidently the natural thing to do with poems, rather uh, than doing it? Well, poems. you know, poets have, I mean, even Emily Dickinson gave it a shot. Um, I mean, it does, it, it, you know, I, again, I, 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 I don't know how to argue that. It does feel to me like, let's put it this way, it, feel, it feels more natural to try to do it. It may indeed be in certain ways less satisfying than the, than the fantasy of, of, of not doing it, imagining that you're Blake or Dickinson. But since you're not, uh, <laughs> one is not. Uh, anyway, that, that's the best I can do. Yes. I, I, you mentioned uh, right at the beginning uh, that you had the pleasure of studying with R.P. Blackmore. Yeah. And I'm wondering uh, what you think you got from, from him. What, uh, I started taking courses. What he was like. Yeah. yeah. Well, what he was like. What I got from Blackmore, what, what, what a number of us got from, I mean, Blackmore at the time, um, seemed quite old. It was very sad. Um, this didn't make him unique at Princeton, but he, he, dra <laughs> he, drank, he drank a great deal. I mean, uh, um, he was pretty isolated uh, in the English department except for younger men whose friendship with him often meant that they wouldn't get tenure at Princeton. He had been brought to Princeton by, well, that's a whole other story. He, he spoke the way he wrote. Um, which yeah. is to see, yeah, with, with that kind of terrific, uh, I mean, intensity, but also obscurity. So it was not the case that, you know, one sat there at 18 or 19 and understood everything Blackmer said. But what Blackmer conveyed, above all, was the supreme value of, of, of poetry and art. He read, he read poetry in his, he'd sit in the front of the room. He had sort of a condition in his legs. He would sit and he would smoke. Um, he held the cigarette between the middle finger and the ring finger of these stained but sort of porcelain hands, um, which he sort of would manipulate as a whole. And so he's a very, very compelling figure. Um, he had a kind of remarkable voice. But he... Everything he did turned on Yeats, Eliot, some pound, Stevens, Crane from his this Emson's missing dates. He would he would read passages to us. I mean, I will never get his voice reading the little the Terzarima section of Little Gidding out of my head, and so on. And and then he would speak about those things. And what he what you, he made you feel was that it would be worth devoting your entire life to be able to produce any three lines of any of that, and that the real reward might be that someday R.P. Blackmer would read those lines, you know, in that voice. So I, and I was not the only one, we, you would, we would leave Blackmer's class and run, not walk, back to one's room and just start working on poems, if Blackmer was just this. Then in addition to that, I, I did creative writing with him. I mean, I did a poetry thesis. And my senior year, uh, I actually had lunch with him once a week at a restaurant in uh, Princeton named Laez. And I was always trying to get him to talk about poetry and reminisce about it. And he would only talk about Maine and the mating habits of the plover on the <laughs> coast. <laughs> and it was like, wildly frustrating. But, you know, that was, that, was good. <laughs> that was good to know, too. But he was, he was, in that sense, he was inspirational. He was also, I would say, I mean, part of the power that he had. The reason why there are so many people like myself who unhesitatingly describe themselves as black or students is that it wasn't a distinction. He didn't choose one. It was as if he was deeply passive with respect to who happened to sit in his courses or who wrote poetry with him or anything like that. You attached yourself to Blackman, um, and he just put up with it until you graduated. Um, uh, but there are any number of people. I mean, um, the poets for several generations who who, who, who were Blackman students in that sense. But what he what he conveyed was 
a sense of the absolute, which I completely have internalized. I mean, in this sense, I'm going backwards. Inadvertent creation. You know, the supreme value of being able to write. You know, if you could write Yeats's Deep Sworn Vow, get those six lines to fight back. That's it. That's it. Uh, there's nothing greater you could do in life. That I, that I completely bought. Great. Can I ask you something to follow up yeah. on that? It seems in the book, in uh, Next Bend, uh, that, the, um, that the place of that is in Central European poetry rather than in English language poetry. Does that have some significance? I mean, to, yeah, it's an interesting Spider question. Spider had, had an English language canon. He, no, absolutely. And I, I accept that English language. I mean, I, all those poets I, I named seem to me um, wonderful poets. Um, but you're absolutely right. It's, a, it's been a difference between me and, uh, I mean, not, uh, not a, well, yes, it's been a difference between myself and Grossman. Well, Gross, there are certain, I mean, Grossman's been increasingly engaged with Ceylon and he's been in, engaged with Rilke for a long time. But fundamentally, Alan's thinking in terms of the, the great English tradition. Um, I, the kind of lyric poet that I that I am, I'm, I've found tremendous inspiration in in the imaginations, the modes of poetic organization in poems by a number of not just Central European but European poets. Um, so I would say I've been deeply um, influenced, stirred by. Uh, Kavafi by uh, what I get out of reading Mandelstam or Akhmatova um, certainly Ungaretti uh, I love I love Montali but I have not been able to use Montali but Ungaretti I've been able to use um, Spanish language I suppose, above all, um, Vallejo of Los Heraldos Negros, which I think is just one of the great poetic books of, the, again, the 20th century. Um, Transtromer, who I think is magnificent. Um, so I, so that's, that's part of an answer. The other part, the other part of the answer is... And this too comes in part out of conversations with Grossman. At a certain point, I think one has a desire, or one can have the desire, to try to break out of the purely domestic norms of most English and American poetry right, of the last 50 years or whatever. I mean, it's not our fault as poets that we haven't been terrorized by oppressive regimes. I mean, all you, you understand what I'm saying. That, that we, or had the Second World War happen on our ground, and so on and so forth. But one result of the fact that we've been spared so much is that there are intensities that have appeared in poetry elsewhere that have not been open to us in anything but a kind of theatrical or illegitimate mode. I mean, something like Ted Hughes' Crow, if I don't believe a line on it, for example. So, one thing that happens in the next bend in the road is the engagement with oh, in something like a poem about Ceylon's widow, but also the Kleist, also uh, the poems about Mandelstam. Could there be a way of reaching out imaginatively to these other poets and artists who underwent such different experiences, whose poetry expresses that, and could one tap into that at a remove, not by ventriloquizing and I hope not illegitimately, but could, if one could set up an imagination to imagination engagement, then one might be able to enlarge the range of what one could say. And that's, that's what that comes out of. Yeah. Uh -huh.
in, those two things. In, in answering you, you referred to the, the domesticity of American, mm -hmm. American poetry, and you began the reading with, I think, courageously with the poems about your daughter. Mm -hmm. uh, and those are poems about domestic Absolutely. joys. Absolutely. And they're poems that are, I think, inaccessible emotionally coming out of American modernism. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's very hard, I think, coming out of Eliot mm -hmm. Pound to write of affection mm -hmm. uh, the, the way you do. So, I mean, it's a kind of... It's yeah, I understand. I, 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 hear, I hear what you're saying. No, and obviously I feel... You know, many of the poems I've written are just are love poems. They're poems about sexual desire. And then there are poems about my daughter. That's right. I mean, I agree with that. Um, I suppose what I, what, I, what, I, what I got, I mean, Eliot for me remains the great poet in English of the 20th century. The Wasteland is for me the absolute achievement. Um, but what I get out of Eliot I, and various of them, and I've never been I've never been interested in, what can I say, the strategies or the persona or the distancing or the ironies. Or, um, it's the ear and the eye. I mean, it's the, the loud lament of the disconsolate chimera. It's, you know, it's, so at a very early age, um, Eliot, but also the things in print, just imprinted me incredibly so that my sense of the poetic intensity, especially on the level of the line, um, that's what I got out of it. Um, and then what I feel is like one tries to just use that for one's own purposes. But yes, I, you know, the, the, the strange thing, the other strange thing about poetry, and this relates to what, I mean, this is another, I, I think about this all the time. One's aiming to produce these autonomous, perfect, intense works of art, the standards are. Okay. But poetry, unlike painting or sculpture or music, Poetry comes to us through other people. Right? It comes to us through our lives, through other people. It's, it's almost unbearable that it does. And the stress can be fantastic in the lives of, say, the Lowell generation. One sees it. Uh, and, it and, and everything can go wrong. The lives can go wrong. In the I mean, someone like Lowell, you see after a certain point, it's all gone wrong. Right? The life's gone amok and the poetry is just nowhere. Um, uh, but... I mean, there's this wonderful story of Jimenez, who very, very late in life, uh, he's probably 90, he's given the Nobel Prize um, for literature, and he says, he's completely uninterested. Um, his wife should have gotten it, and she's dead. So it's too late, so he's not interested in the Nobel Prize. And it's, it's a touching sort of comic story, but his wife should have gotten it. I mean, so many of the poems, as far as he's concerned, came by it. So, and I think, I think... I won't think this is a generalization about all poetry, but cer certainly one of the things that I had to realize at a certain point in my life is that this poetry that I'm constantly analogizing to a, an abstract painter or an abstract sculptor is also coming through people. Right? And you know, therefore, you and these are gifts from people. And so there's no greater gift than uh, uh, this daughter and, and sort of what she. And I, I feel the whole last book was just made possible by her just exploding the, the bonds of my own uh, defendedness. Yes? Thank you. you probably get asked this all the time, um, but I'm wondering about, um, I have a question about subject matter. Um, you were talking about um, your daughter and uh, the poems of Eros, um, but I'm wondering what what it was like for you to begin writing about art in poetry, and what kinds of permissions? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I, I I held off for a long time. I mean, I found myself holding off, partly because it was such a genre, such a subgenre at a certain moment. I mean, I think of John Hollander and a whole lot of poets. So writing ekphrasis and and just poems about paintings just it was just something people were doing all the time. I mean. A lot of it in response, I mean, the uh, to Auden's uh, Musée des Beaux-Arts and so on. And so I just thought, 
man, let that go. <laughs> Don't even think about it. Just, just use the art some other way. I mean, make poems that could have the, the intensity that you feel in front of certain paintings and sculptures. That same presentness, that all at onceness, that all there. I mean, these are you know, not a lot of the values in my poetry are sort of anti-discursive. That if I, I keep wanting to, you know, that's what I want. But then at a certain point, I realized, and, and Grossman, I think, was a help in this, um, I, I, that I was cutting myself off from natural sources. Um, and especially when one day I was walking around Rome, the this Dejeuner sur Lab poem started to come. And I realized this thing was right. I thought, you know, how wonderful. The painting in the world that means more to me than any other painting in the world um, is going to actually have a poem. So, so yes. Uh, but it was it was an event. You know, it's also true that a number of the other things, um, visual things in the book, are, can often be slightly um, off center, like Kafka's drawings and so on. So it's not as if I have a desire to work through a museum of great paintings. Did you find that you were able to um, write about art, for instance, the Dejeuner sort of, um, um, you know, the calligraphic frog and things like? Yeah. Uh, were you, did you find you were able to write about? Images differently in a poem that, than you had been. Before. Yeah, you know, it's it's funny. I think I say this in a footnote in the poetry book. I mean, a little note in the back. When I when I wrote uh, Man, when I finally published the full version of Manet's Modernism, I had this feeling, and and so did Tim Clark, who read the manuscript, that it would be great to sort of be able to bring the déjeuner back one last time, and just see it as encapsulating everything that had been going on in the book. And there was just no way to do it rhetorically. But it just, it f emotionally, <laughs> the sort of desire stayed with me. And when that poem started to come, I did have the feeling, okay, this is the return to the déjeuner. And yes, there is no way art historically of saying, you know, the woman in the middle distance seems, I repeat, seems to be douching herself, you know. You might say, she appears possibly to be douching herself, but, you know, <laughs> seems, I repeat, seems that which, which seems, you know, absolutely crucial to the way you want to say it. Um, Yes, so that's right. It does make possible another way of speaking. And yet I would, I would like to feel there's some connection. Well, if there are no more questions, I thank you all for your uh, wonderful attention.